So hi everybody, this is Sanu the Honda Mackinen, and you are not listening to a White Devil podcast. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, this is just going to be a video for YouTube, and I thought about making this into a podcast, but I decided not to. And basically, all I wanted to do in this little video uh, was to talk about something that's going to be starting uh, this Sunday, this weekend. Um, some people, if you if you've subscribed subscribed to my second channel, you might remember a long, long time ago I made a video series about um, about Formula Ones, and on this channel I've also played some uh, I played a Formula One video game with Ville. So that's basically me prefacing a little bit that uh, the Formula One season is starting. Uh, Formula One's really the only sport that I follow to any serious extent, and so I thought I wanted to do a little video to discussing. Uh, the oncoming season and what my expectations are for it. Now, if you don't uh, care for Formula Ones, that's fine. If you want to click away now, that <laughs> uh, it's it's fine. But I maybe hope to discuss my uh, thoughts in a way that could possibly be interesting, uh, even for you know people for who don't care for Formula One so much. So um, basically, there's a, I basically have a structure that I've kind of thought of uh, beforehand that I want to go through. I, I want to basically go through the each of the teams this year and what my expectations are for them. And there's some couple of general topics I want to discuss. And I thought about first discussing them up front here at the front of the podcast. One of them is a very obvious physical change to the car. But I, I think I'll save that until the very, very end. Um, okay, so uh, quick... Just a quick recap on my history with the sport is that uh, I started watching Formula Ones actively around 2001, I want to say. 2001 must have been like the first season that I watched seriously. Maybe 2000, but my memories from that far back are pretty, pretty hazy. So, and before that, incidentally. But I like the sport. Um, I think there's a lot of frustrating things about the sport. I think the politics behind the sport are sometimes a little bit bullshit. Some of the controversies uh, are a little bit bullshit. And there's like a few things that I'm not going to even comment on, which is like, you know, getting rid of the grid girls or, you know, and uh, engine noises, which is, you know, you know, just complete nothing burger as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of things that people complain. People love to complain about shit in Formula Ones that does just meaningless garbage. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about now is what do I think of the team's preseason, and I'm going to avoid any kind of crystal balling things. That This is not what this is about. I'm just going to talk about where I think the teams stand coming off from the previous season, the 2017 season. In case you weren't following, of course, Lewis Hamilton won that season uh, with Mercedes GP, uh, clearly the number one driver in the number one team right now. That's the combo, uh, Hamilton and Mercedes. So... Let's start with the top teams, and we'll work our way down. Um, there's really like top three teams, and there was a big, a big, a, there's a big problem I had with last season, which was it wasn't, it honestly just wasn't a very interesting season. I'm, go, I'm willing to admit that, even as a fan of the sport, uh, Hamilton just had, <laughs> Hamilton just had a way too big of an advantage. Uh, he was racing for the first time with the teammate, the Finnish teammate Valtteri Bottas, after the 2016 champ, Nico Rosberg, uh, left the sport, retired after winning his one and only championship. Uh, short, um, and to say something about that short, in short, is that good, you know, good for him. He did a absolutely the right choice, in my view. <laughs> Quit while you're ahead. Um, so, as far as Mercedes is concerned, and as far as their internal conflict, well, the thing is, there really is no internal conflict in Mercedes anymore because uh, the thing that became very obvious last season, of course, is that Valtteri uh, was very happy being second fiddle to Lewis Hamilton. Is he going to challenge him for the championship this year? I mean, last year we can forgive Bottas for a lot of things because he was in a new team for the first season, and that's always tough. But, you know, this is a championship-winning car. So, and also another thing, I, I, I'll, you know, 
I'll say enough, enough about I'll say this much about the cars and the technical aspects that have uh, that not a lot has changed since last year. And these years are always uh, me, and that always just means that whoever was top dog at the end of last season is probably going to be top dog at the start of this season, unless like they royally screw up the car design. Okay, but we're not seeing like a big shift in F1 engines right now. So, like, such as when we see, saw back in 2013. And we're not expected one until, um, I don't remember the year exactly, maybe it's 2021, 2022. So it's going to be quite a while before there's another big shift in the F1 engines. And that, that's a big thing because it means it usually kind of evens out the power uh, performance, um, uh, the performance gap between all the F1 teams. Um, and that we're, And this is not one of those years. This is one of those years, of course, when things have changed very little, Mercedes are going to probably be the top dog. So the real question is, the only team who was um, even in the same league last year was Ferrari. But So Ferrari was faster than everybody else, but they were not as fast as Mercedes, which, was a really fr which leads, leads to this very frustrating situation where Mercedes is always top dog, Ferrari takes second place in everything, and then it's everybody else. So, um, so really, the thing that we need to see this year is Ferrari catching up to Mercedes, because I think they really are the only team right now who can challenge them. And I know that's not something people are particularly happy about. Okay, they have probably the single most popular driver duo of the whole sport right now. All, the whole sport. There's Kimi Raikkonen and Sebastian Vettel. Uh, One-time champion and a four-time champion. And, um, but a lot of people have been saying, like, for instance, Raikkonen is really just being kept around at this point because he is so popular. The fans love him, but he's, like, best racing days are behind him. And I can agree with that. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to pull... <laughs> I know he's my homeboy, but <laughs> I'm not going to pull, like, uh, you know... I, I, I'm just going to admit the facts. But Raikkonen is still, on a good day, fast. He definitely can pull off great performances, but that was just the problem. Ferrari were fast; they were just not fast as they were not as fast as Mercedes. And uh, it's unlike. And the thing that really needs to happen this year is that Ferrari needs to be able to challenge Mercedes right from the get-go, right from the start of a race. And uh, really, if there's any really heated conflict going on right now, because of course. Vettel and Ra the same way Bottas and Hamilton have gotten gotten off to a really good start. Of course, Vettel and Raikkonen they're pretty much best buddies, so you know there's there's not much conflict there. The real conflict is Vettel versus Hamilton. Okay, now I will count one more team into the top tier, and then we'll be done with the top tier. And it's the other team using the other engine, <laughs> Red Bull. Red Bull has two excellent drivers. They have Daniel Ricciardo, they have Max, Max Verstappen. Unfortunately, they're, the, the, the bane of their existence has been the Renault engine. The Renault engine was the reason... I mean, Red Bull could get dynamite performances last year, but they had an engine that would not last. They kept blowing through them. And of course, if people, if you don't, if people don't know, for instance, uh, I need to clarify this, of course. Uh, last year... All the teams were allowed to use four engines through the whole season. This year, they're allowed to only use three engines. Uh, Mercedes and Ferrari, if they really, really try, I think they can pull it off. Red Bull is fucked, unless Renault has really, really worked uh, the engines. And by the way, if you're looking at uh, the stats on Wikipedia, Wikipedia usually has very good pages on the Formula One seasons. You will notice that there it says that they use something called the Tog Heuer engine, but the Tog Heuer is just a branding thing. It's a Renault engine. It's the Renault engine. It's the same engine every Renault-supported team uses. So Red Bull uh, are taking a real... Uh, well, they're not taking a risk. They're, they're, they're in the same situation because they can't go to Ferrari or Mercedes for an engine because those two are their number one uh, opponents. And if this year Ferrari, I mean, sorry, Renault finally fixes the reliability issues, Red Bull could come back. Red Bull could finally be uh, back in the game, challenging the top teams because they have really fast, really daring drivers. I don't necessarily think uh, of much of Max Verstappen as a person, but he's really fast. Okay. 
and Daniel Ricciardo also. He had a couple of really, really good uh, moments a few years ago when Red Bull still wasn't uh, at the at, at the at the crisis level with their engines and engine parts that they were that they've been in the last couple of years. Okay, and. I don't personally mind if Mercedes wins the season, but I would l- at least like to see a much better fight for the championship. I would m- much rather see uh, a real fight between the top teams. So that's really the main thing to hope for from the top teams. But uh, if Ferrari have not made a decent enough improvement and if Red Bull still has those reliability issues with the engine, yeah, it might look... The top, the battle for the championship is probably not going to be very interesting this year. Okay, so let's move down to the middle tier. Excuse me, I'll take a sip of water. Mm. Okay, so there's four teams to talk about in the middle tier, and then we'll get to the backlot teams, the teams that did the poorest last year. Uh, In the middle tier, the one that I want to get out of the way really, the two I really want to get out of the way kind of quickly is Williams, no, not Williams, Haas. Let's talk about Haas. Uh, Haas, I, 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 I kind of rank them a little into the the bottom end of the middle tier. Like, I like the fact that Haas is a team that managed to come into the sport a couple of years ago and actually managed to score points, but they're not really doing a lot to improve. Um, they're kind of just stuck in this limbo of occasionally scoring points, and the thing is they have uh, Roman Grosjean, who's become a pretty de- decent driver in recent years. And Kevin Magnussen, who had a promising beginning at McLaren a few years ago, now he's kind of there just to pad out the scores. I mean, uh, to be fair, like, K- McLaren did a really scummy move by f- firing him uh, after one season. So that's another, that's another driver who has been rejected by the big teams, and his career has really suffered because of it. But I honestly don't think Kevin K. Mag. Um, honestly, I have not been impressed with K. Mag's performance at Haas. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, and so Haas, there's not really not much to talk about there. Now with Force India, also not much to talk about. But I think Force India is really in the was really at the peak of their performance or has been for the past couple of years. They have Esteban Ocon, they have Sergio Perez, both really. Excellent drivers, and if I was talking about the how harmonious and you know great things are over at uh, Mercedes and Ferrari, then things have not been so great as Force India, of course, because these drivers seem to be each other's worst enemies. However, I saw a little news piece where they said that they're they've made their peace with each other uh, at the start of the season. The real, the, really, the thing that I'm kind of wondering uh, about, and by the way, Force India sticking with the pink color for the car, which I actually do enjoy very much. I like the fact that the F1 teams have started to get weird with their color colorations again because uh, for the past few years we've seen a lot of like red, black, uh, red, black, and white mostly, uh, and maybe some grayish. Uh, so, and I'm not a real big fan of that. Really, not a fan of, of the Haas color scheme, for instance. So, something like Force India brightens up the brightens up the uh, the grid a lot. So, uh, provided Force India doesn't make any big uh, mistakes at the start of the season, I think they're actually in the higher end of the middle tier. Do I think they have a shot at a podium? That remains to be seen. Like, like I said, like Red Bull, of course, they have their performance issues, but they're still like. Even if you take them out of the picture, then you still have four cars in total when you uh, count the Mercedes and for the Ferraris. But who can say? But who knows? Possibly. The thing that we've been really expecting, and the, the, really the thing that I'm expecting right now, is to hear the news on Force India's name change. Uh, they were going to, last year they were talking about changing the uh, team's name to Force One to distance themselves from the Kingfisher Airlines, VJ Malia, and uh, obviously, India. Uh, they feel like uh, that it's kind of like that this image branding thing with uh, Force India is kind of holding them back. And you know, I, I'm all for uh, a good name change as much as anybody, but they've they've kind of fumbled the ball with it. Uh, they've been fumbling it a little bit. So um, I don't know when we're gonna finally get to that. Get to it. Okay. So. I think Force India are on good ground. Also on good ground, in my view, is Williams. Now, Williams has a really fresh driver duo. Last year, we had Lance Stroll enter the team, 
uh, when Bottas moved to Mercedes because of well, because Rosberg left Mercedes. So and Lance Stroll had a <laughs> he, he had a something that I would he he had a very tumultuous uh, rookie season. So he had a lot of lot of retirements, a lot of crashes. Uh, he he took a lot of shit very early in the season, but then he also scored points and. He also scored a podium, and that was very, very important. I think that was the thing that proved to everybody that Lance Stroll actually deserves to be in the Williams car driving in Formula Ones. I thought, because before this, the fact, that, the fact of the matter is that his dad owns part share in Williams. That probably pissed off a lot of people. So, But I think last year, Stroll proved once and for all that, yes, I, I deserve to be here. So the second season, what really needs to happen with Stroll is that we need to get rid of that tumultuous up and down movement where sometimes you score points, sometimes you go home empty handed. Like the thing that Williams and Stroll really need now is an even season. They need to be able to be on the be in the top 10 consistently, be able to make, uh, score points. I think they can totally do it. It's all up to Stroll in my opinion. Now their rookie, uh, and this is a guy who was supposed to actually make his F1 debut. I remember a few years ago they were talking about this. We have a new Russian driver, Sergei Sorotkin. He's coming in, uh, lots of hype around him, and I always tend to be, uh, you know, I get, uh, I have an aversion to any kind of driver hype because going from lower division of uh, open cockpit racing into Formula Ones, it's always a big shift. And honestly, like rookies. Rookies usually don't have to worry. Like, you're allowed a terrible rookie season. Just as long as you don't repeat it for your second season, if indeed you are lucky enough to even get the second chance. So, honestly, I don't think Sorotkin has, you know, too much pressure. Uh, of course, it would be nice to see a new rising talent in the sport. I'm always excited when I see uh, new drivers who clearly know what the hell they're doing. Am I a little better, you know, am I a little better that Sorotkin beat Robert Kupicha for this driver position? Yes. Yes, I am a little bit. I was really, really hoping Robert Kupicha, uh, Polish F1 driver, there was a big hole of blue yes, last year that he might finally be able to come back into Formula 1s after being away for a long time because of injuries that he uh, suffered from during uh, when he was uh, racing rally. But he's been picked up as Williams' reserve driver. So if something happens to Stroll, if something happens to Zorotkin, we may yet see Robert Kupicha race in a Formula 1 Grand Prix. And I'm really excited for that. Of course, I don't, of course, I don't wish anything horrible happens to Stroll or Zorotkin. But, um, yeah, like I said, Zorotkin is also, he's also privileged in the sense that, like I said, it's his rookie season. It's a season you're allowed to make mistakes, you're allowed to maybe not have that much great performance. But, of course, if you can score points, that's a plus. That already shows everybody that you mean business. And if he if he even pulls an even more surprising move and maybe, like, even achieves a podium, hey, that's great. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm, re I'm, all, I'm all for this. And, of course... Um, uh, well, I, I should I should also say that like Russian drivers have had a bit of a horrible track record, yeah, or let, let's move more precisely, Russian drivers have had have typically had terrible luck in Formula One. You have to only remember Vitaly Petrov, Daniel Kvyat, both of them great drivers with great futures that were just <laughs> stolen away from them. Uh, so uh, that, that the only thing I can really hope for is that the same thing doesn't happen to Sorotkin. Okay. And Renault, Renault really, really picked up the pace. So this is the team Renault. Renault was really picking up the pace at the end of last season when they acquired Carlos Sainz into the team uh, on lease from Toro Rosso. So uh, Carlos Sainz Jr. is part of the uh, Red Bull driver program. So normally that means that he would be driving for Toro Rosso, and then if chance, perchance when Max Verstappen or Daniel Ricciardo ends up leaving Red Bull, he could have a chance of um, ascending to that team. And uh, Renault's had, of course, the Renault team has had its ups and downs. They've had really, really tumultuous years going quite, quite, a, way, quite a ways back, even back to when they were Lotus some years ago. Um, but Saints, when he finally got into the Renault car, he was really showing that he was dynamite, showing that, and basically showing that Toro Rosso might have made a big mistake by letting their single most talented driver go. 
Uh, Science has teamed up with Nico Hulkenberg, and Nico Hulkenberg, good, decent, uh, reliable driver who will score points on a good day. Not a superstar. <laughs> I know that might anger some people. I like Nico Hulkenberg. Seriously, I do. I, I, I think uh, he has deserved he's been able he's deserved his position in formula ones because he is a consistent driver who scores points for the team that makes the teams happy so do i think saints has a shot at a podium not really like i think i think williams and force india are still slightly stronger than renault but like i said everything that really depends if we're going to have an interesting season or not i think everything all that depends on the renault engine this year is the renault engine reliable this year if it's reliable we'll see red bull probably giving mercedes and ferrari a run for their money and if it's reliable we might see renault really give williams and force india a fight for their money uh yeah i kind of flip-flop on my opinions with renault as a team because um obviously their engine uh, their engine provider uh, the engine division has been having problems for the past few years but they may have a chance. They may have a chance to finally, like, shiny up that, uh, that Renault badge of theirs. Uh, the, uh, not, it's not a Chevron. The diamond. <laughs> the Renault diamond. They have a chance of shining up that Renault diamond once again and making it look good. Okay. So what about the back lot? What about the, uh, the kids at the back? Who, are, who have been doing really, really poorly these last few years? I think I have to... Well... There's one team that I'm really, really dreading uh, what's going to happen to them last this year. But there's two teams, two teams that have switched engines, engine providers for uh, this oncoming season. And it's big because we've been talking only, I've been talking about Mercedes, I've been talking about Ferrari, I've been talking about Renault. But there's, of course, one more engine provider. Toro Rosso is going to start the season as a Honda supporting team. And McLaren who have really, really had really bad... The last three seasons have been really, really bad for them, are abandoning Honda and going for Renault. Now, there were the, the winter tests were just a little while ago, and there were some there was already some things abuzz that Toro Rosso was saying that basically they and Honda are just doing... like They're, they're, they're just peachy. Everything's just going smoothly and fine. And what, did, what happened to McLaren in the winter tests? Their car broke down all the time. But, and that sounds bad. That sounds bad. It immediately like sounds like, did McLaren, did a, did McLaren do a boo-boo by uh, switching from Honda to Renault? Well, I'm going to be honest. Well, if, there, if, there is a pl if there's a correct place for a car to break down, it's during winter tests. That's when you should have all your problems so that you can fix them before the first race of the season. And mind you, like, I always give... I always try not to judge the season too much based on the first two to three races. The third race or the fourth race is where you really start to see, like, where does everybody actually stand? Because um, a, lot of, a lot of crazy shit can happen during those first two races that will make everything look a little wacky. Um, and, then, and then it evens out from there. Of course, you know... Some years, like 2016, when Nico Rosberg won four Grand Prix in a row, like that's usually a sign that, okay, something big might be going on, you know, and we can't put this down to just a statistical oddity. So, okay. So what about Toro Rosso? Toro Rosso says that they are doing well. And last year, last year Toro Rosso and Renault were really at each other's necks. Uh, I mean, Red Bull and Renault had this kind of a, a feuding kind of a teen drama thing going a couple of years ago when they were even threatening that they might leave the sport and Renault was threatening they would leave the sport. Everybody was basically leaving the sport. It was going to be the death of Formula Ones. And yeah, right. So, <laughs> so, um, but Renault and Red Bull, obviously, they worked out their differences. They kind of had this peaceful uh, divorce situation with the Tog Heuer branding and everything. And Toro Rosso, on the other hand, uh, yeah, and Toro Rosso then last year had the big hissy fit and fight uh, with um, uh, with Renault at the very end, uh, towards the end of the season. And Toro Rosso were doing pretty poorly to begin with. Like Carlos Sainz was doing fairly okay, but then Daniel Kvyat, who had been demoted from uh, Red Bull, and I'm still really really bitter about that fact. I think Red Bull Red Bull are you know without question. 
you know, responsible for ruining his F1 career. Yeah. But, uh, as people should know, Dan Kvyat right now is the Ferrari reserve driver, so so there's a possibility we might see Daniel Kvyat in an F1 car this year. Not a big, you know, not a very, a very likely chance, but hey, uh, you, you gotta take what you get. Um, okay, so Toro Rosso has at least from the beginning of... Um, Based on the winter test, they've said that things are going well. I tend to not put a lot of weight on the winter test because some some of the results might be deceiving. But it's nice to hear that Charles Rosso and Honda have gotten off on a good foot. It would be much more worrisome to hear that they did the switch and then something went wrong. But what about their drivers? Well, Pierre Gasly, I was still like fo- following Formula E's last uh, last year. This year, I have not been able to do so uh, because of different reasons. <laughs> so I know Pierre Gasly is a decent driver, but he had to come in very, very late last year, and coming into uh, a Formula One season mid-season is never, you know, never a good thing. So I'm for- willing to forgive him for his poor performances. Um, really kind of hope Gasly does good, because then we have also Brendan Hartley, and I have nothing against the man. He also had to come in at the in the middle of the season last year. But neither one of these drivers is really, like, grabbing me. Neither one of them is really, like, sh- showing me that they're, like, super awesome, good drivers. I, I'm, I'm a little... I'm honestly a little uh, skeptical about their chances of... As drivers, I really do hope, though, that Toro Rosso would be able to go back into being in the middle tier, because they've, Toro Rosso has been, they've never been top tier, but they've been, even at their best, they've been really, like, top of the middle tier, and I would really, really like to see Toro Rosso back there again, because, uh, you know, I like rooting for the underdog, let's, let's face it, so, they have a chance, but it really does come down to, has Honda fixed the issues that we, that the engine clearly had, well, I say clearly, there, we we want, might wait until it comes to McLaren. But let's hope that Honda has fixed the issues and Toro Rosso's car works and that the Honda c- engine is reliable because they had the same issue as with Renault. It, their, their problems wasn't just the fact that the engine seemed to be weak. It was also unreliable. Bad combo, which is why McLaren, one of the most historically significant teams, has had awful three seasons. And speaking of McLaren, so they've moved on to Renault. I think the switch is doing wonders for Fernando Alonso's peace of mind, and um, yeah, I I really, really, really kind of wish you know to be don't be, to be fair. I'm not the world's biggest McLaren fan, not anymore. You know, I always say like there's there. Are, I, I like to say that there's no heroes uh, in Formula One. There are assholes, and then there are unbelievable assholes. But uh, so. McLaren, it, it it does pain me a little bit to see like how low McLaren has had to sunk in the last couple of years because of this Honda situation. Now, I really, really hope, and uh, this might be a completely vain hope, but I really, really hope that now that they've switched to Renault, they are able to get their performance up, they'll be able to score points consistently. I, I would not dare to hope that they actually have a... Sh- chance in hell of actually getting a podium this year, but hey, uh, McLaren move quick on their feet, and if the engine is workable, if the car is workable, then McLaren will improve. That's the main thing. Like, even at their worst, even when even when they've been at their worst, towards the end of the season, McLaren has tended to improve. Even if it's in the last couple of years they haven't been able to improve a lot, they always improve. But there is also kind of a chance here that... Um, McLaren's put the blame squarely on Honda for all their problems these past few years. And this will kind of show if they were really telling the truth or was it was it all just putting blame on Honda because it was easy to put blame on Honda. I mean, the thing that I've got, gathered from all of this is that McLaren and Honda as just institutions, for some reason, they just couldn't click. They just couldn't work together. I don't know how things are going to be with Renault. Because Renault has his own, because Renault have their own team, um, and obviously they want to favor the team as much as possible, as much as possible with within like the rules of the game, the rules of the sport. So, uh, so we we have Fernando Alonso, we have Stoffel Van Dorn, and Stoffel Van Dorn, good driver. Uh, I remember when he substituted uh, that one time and did re- really really well. 
but of course he's been driving with an unreliable car and an unreliable engine. So here's hoping that things will finally pick up. And then there's Sauber, and oh god, Sauber. I just today read, <laughs> I just read today uh, an interview from their like uh, the 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 uh, team principal Vesser, uh, that he uh, that he and Charles Leclerc, who's the new driver, uh, agree are both in agreement that the only way Sauber is going to score points this season is if the if the other teams fail. Yeah, that is not encouraging. I mean, Sauber has really, really gone down the pecking order a lot from, like, 2010. And I just gotta ask, what the fuck is Marcus Erickson still doing in this team? He has accomplished nothing throughout his entire F1 career. And I'm sorry, I like to root for the Nordic drivers most of the time, but God damn it, like, he should not be here. Pascal Verlein scored points for the team last year. What's he doing now? <laughs> he's a fucking... <laughs> he's a... He's a fucking Mercedes reserve driver. Lots of, like, potentially good drivers are now reserve drivers. What the hell? And this clown is still here. And then we have Charles Leclerc, which is exciting. It's exciting to see Charles Leclerc there, because last year he won the GP2 champion. We have never... I don't think we've seen... In at least a few, a few, quite a few years, we have not seen... A fresh GP2 champion get in a Formula 1 car straight off from winning a championship. They usually have to, like, drive another season and probably spend that season as a test and reserve driver in Formula 1s before they actually get the chance. And that's kind of, this kind of puts a lot of pressure on Leclerc to do well. But and when he's saying... When he's saying that there's no way in hell that they're scoring points, like, that is not encouraging. Like, I, I, I can't believe, what, what the fuck is Sauber really doing at this point? I like the team. I, I, I've always liked the team, and I, I hate to see, it's the same way as McLaren, I, hate, I would hate to see them go. But for God's sake, like, they have not been able to get their act together. It's pretty obvious. So I'm not hopeful for Sauber. It's basically what I'm getting at. I'm really, really hope that both Toro Rosso and McLaren finally pick up the pace. And I like cheering on the underdogs, but really, I've lost all faith in Sauber at this point. All right, well, I've been going on for quite a while, so let's finally wrap this up. So I have a couple of issues with uh, things. Um, one of them, of course, is one issue that I'm going to be talking about is the Halo, but I'll breeze through that very quickly. So what about the... The more thing that the thing that I really really am a little annoyed about is the F1 calendar because this F1 calendar is going to be the longest ever. Let me just quickly check. But last year was 20 races, uh, and this year I think they added one. Yeah, 21 races, and the season starts this Sunday, March 25th. It's going to end on the 25th of November. Last year, I mean, la the provided you know. Last year, the season wasn't very exciting because Mercedes were so dominant. But I honestly just lost all interest in the season about halfway through. Like after the summer, I just not good. I just could not give a shit after that. It and it was partly also because the races were really dull. It wasn't just because Mercedes were so dominant. The races were just dull, and there were too many of them. And there would have, there was still a chance. There would have been a chance for uh, Ferrari to catch up, maybe, but they didn't. So it was kind of like just painstakingly waiting just for the final shot to come, so that we could finally put the <laughs> put the season to to into its grave. And I and I really wish. I honestly, at this point, I'd be willing. I'd be happy with like a ten race season. Honestly, like twenty one is way too long. Like. What's going to happen? Realistically speaking, within five races, we know who are the real championship contenders. Halfway through the season, it's going to be, it's going to become painfully evident, like which two to three drivers even have a chance. By the by, the fall, it's probably going to be completely obvious who's going to win the championship. So, yeah, that's a, that's really my main complaint this year is that I don't think we need a season with 21 races come the fuck on okay and then there's the halo and people have been complaining a lot about the halo people need to remember we are living in a post jules bianchi world if you don't know who that is go google it it will not take long but basically 
you know, the last F1 driver to die in a Formula, Formula One race. After that, FIA, uh, which is the governing sports body of Formula One, started a big campaign to improve uh, the safety of the sport. And I, uh, you know, the FIA, I give them a lot of shit, but, I, but they do move quickly when it comes to um, these kinds of things, because this is obviously kind of serious. Nobody wants to see races, uh, multiple races, where F1 drivers die. Even one is too many. So we've known about the halo. We know that it's coming. And people are, you know, going apeshit over it um, because it makes the cars look ugly. And its function is to protect the driver's head. So we're talking about a complete apples to oranges um, comparison. People stop complaining about the halo for fuck's sake. Uh, in IndyCar, they uh, adopted a something similar, but a, st a slightly different strategy. They're actually putting in a transparent plexiglass. But all the drivers have been saying that, you know, it doesn't impede their vision that much. And the most important thing is that it stops flying projectiles from hitting the drivers in the head. That's the only thing that matters. Okay, this is a function versus form uh, debate. It's a completely senseless debate, just like the one about the engine noises. It, so, just be, people just stop complaining about the halo. It's not a big deal. And I trust me, trust me when I say this, after the first two races, you won't even know it's there. It's the same thing that happened with the crocodile noses a few years ago when they had to make the cars. Every time, like, F1 fans are like the pettiest fucking bullshitters I know. Like, they talk about talk such a big sh big shit game about, like, oh, the cars are so ugly. Like, oh, no, no, the engine noises are so bad. And the engine noise thing, you know, that's a complete non... That makes no sense because the engine noises are just expended energy. It's wasted energy, okay? Just like complaining about the engine noise is a complete waste of energy. But also, like, the crocodile nose. That's something that the teams couldn't do. That's just the regulations. Uh, like, unless the regulations are obviously, you know, faulty and uh, and stupid. Like, the radio assistance rule that was kicking a lot of drivers down that were already, like, having trouble during races. Like, that kind of shit. And it was clearly, like, endangering some drivers. You know, that's, like I said, th those are the kind of things that F the FIA, were dry, go, go, you know, acts very quickly uh, on. But this is to protect the drivers, Okay, it's not there to look pretty. So stop it. Knock it off with this bullshit. It's ridiculous. All right, but I think that wraps it up. I hope you found this, this little tangent of a video interest at, at all interesting. Um, so uh, here's looking forward to the season. Here's looking forward to an exciting season. I really, really hope it's an exciting season. Season. Here's hoping the Renault engines will be reliable this year. Here's hoping the Honda engine will be reliable. Here's hoping the new drivers will do well this year. I mean, I want to maintain a positive attitude about this because I do love Formula Ones. But yeah, so this is Honda the Honda Mackinnon. Thank you for listening if you did listen all the way through, and see you on the next one. Bye!